Hello and welcome to season 10 of the Meaning Movement Podcast. If you're watching this, if you're hearing my voice, this is the culmination of a ton of work that my team and I have been doing over the past few months to get ready, to get prepared to 4X our production with this podcast. You may have heard me talk about before how important the Meaning Movement is to me personally and how much I've wanted to see it to go, go to new places and how I'm kind of just throwing everything at the wall, see what sticks, kind of blowing it up to see what's going to happen in this episode and this season of the next couple of months of doing two episodes per week is a piece of that process for me. So I'm so excited to be here with you to be doing this together. So welcome to season 10. David McCraney is a science journalist who's fascinated with brains, minds, and culture. He's the creator of the blog, book, and podcast, You Are Not So Smart, which focuses on understanding self-delusion and motivated reasoning. His second book, You Are Now Less Dumb, was released in 2013. I just love those titles. And his third book, How Minds Change, just came out this year. I've read How Minds Change. It's a big part of the conversation that I got to have with David here today that I'm sharing with you. It is fascinating stuff. I just had so much fun with David. I just love his book. I love just exploring the depth of his career um, with him on this conversation, as well as just this idea of why we hold beliefs and why we change beliefs and what the uh, the levers are that can be used to help with that process of changing what you think, what you believe to be true, and what you believe about the, the world. It's a fascinating conversation. I had a blast. I think you're going to enjoy this one as well. This, of course, is the Meaning Movement Podcast. It's a show about work worth doing. So if you're looking to level up your life, your career, your income, if you're looking for more satisfaction, more meaning, more purpose, more fulfillment, more sense of success in the work that you're doing and the things that you're pursuing, you're in the right place. I'm so excited to have you here with us. Hit that subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening, and then stay tuned for this episode with guest David McCraney. Stay with us. This episode, like all episodes of the Meaning Movement podcast, is made possible by The Calling Course. I just want to say, what, what do I mean by that when I say made possible? It sounds like something that they say in Sesame Street at the beginning or the end. My kids love Sesame Street. What I mean by that is this is a bootstrapped project. I have a course called The Calling Course. It's what I consider the cornerstone or, or flagship offering of the meaning movement. That course is all about work, all about purpose, all about navigating this space of these questions of who am I? What is my life about? Where am I going? What's my contribution going to be? Whether that's right now, in the future, whatever it might be. This podcast has expenses. We pay for those expenses via sales of that calling course, also through sponsorships. Share a little bit more about in just a moment. But I wanted to just, instead of talking about the calling course here today, wanted to share some words from a recent member of the course. This is Ryan. He sent this over and gave me permission to share this with you. So I'm going to read from him his thoughts on being a part of the calling course. He says, discovering more of who I am and how that connects to the world in work is an overwhelming process. It can be hard to know where to start and easy to feel stuck. The meaning movement has been a great acceleration, affirmation, and help in this to me. The Calling Course specifically offered new perspectives and a deeper invitation into who I am and how I can walk the path to becoming my fullest self, connected to others in a mission through work. I love that so much. The combination of material, questions, and direct coaching through Q&A is powerful. I recommend it to anyone doing the hard work of walking deeper into their call. First, thank you so much, Ryan, for those words. They are just so fantastic, and I couldn't have said it better myself, which is why I'm reading them here. If you're listening or watching and you want to know more about the calling course, the course I open up for enrollment periodically I don't have a set schedule at this time, but the best way to know when it's going to be the next enrollment period is going to be opening is for you to be on the email list. You can get on the email list anywhere at themeaningmovement.com. You'll find a bunch of subscribe boxes around the site or go to the calling course, thecallingcourse.com. There is a 
free mini course. It gives just a small taste of what the calling course is all about. If you join that mini course, you'll be sure to be on the list for our next enrollment. So if any of that sounds exciting and enticing to you, make sure to jump on the email list and then you'll be notified when that next enrollment period opens. I just want to take a quick moment to talk about sponsorship. I've always said that this this podcast, this endeavor is made possible by The Calling Course. What that means is it's self-funded, it's bootstrapped, but we are opening the door to sponsors to come alongside us if they're a good fit for our audience. So if you have a business, a service, or work for someone who does that would like to get in front of an audience like ours, shoot us an email at podcast at the We can tell you more about what we have to offer by way of our audience and sponsorship uh, opportunities. And we can take the conversation from there. Podcast at the Thanks so much. David, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the Meaning Movement Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very happy to get into uh, meaning, movement, work, all the other stuff. Uh, it's been fun to, uh, you're meeting me at a very fascinating part, point in my life where I'm thinking a lot about these topics. So, uh, let's perfect go timing then. That's great. We can always do a little bit of coaching. I can, uh, you know, uh, help you, help you figure out your, <laughs> figure out your life. <laughs> I'm, I'm, jo I'm just joking. Uh, the question I, I like to begin with is how do you begin to talk about the work that you do in the world? It's, it's odd. Cause I don't have a really solid identity around what I do. I, I, I have found a way to chase down my obsessions and uh, try to translate them into something that I, so I can convince other people they should be as excited about it as I am. Um, <laughs> so it's author, writer, journalist. I was definitely trained as a journalist, went to school for that, but I uh, did a lot of other stuff that wasn't that until I finally found a way to do that. And yeah. uh, so these days when I put it on a CV, I say I'm a science journalist, but what I really do is I am deeply fascinated with brains and, and deeply fascinated with minds and, and culture and how all this stuff blends together. Cause I try to, I have a lot of questions about what it means to be a person and how hard it is to be mm. a person and how strange mm. it is. And yeah. I'll start going down a path where, oh, okay, this, this seems like there's something here. This seems important. This seems like something that has value. And then that'll become an obsession that turns into a project and I'll either make it into a podcast or a book or an article or I've worked on a couple of documentaries. Uh, so is that, that's, that's what I do. It's a strange thing to, a strange I answer. But this is the best I can do. It's a fantastic, <laughs> a fantastic answer. And I love what you said about um, being fascinated with, you know, what it not, this isn't exactly the words that you use, but what it means to be, to be human, um, I think is, is, you know, it's relevant to this, to the, to the topic, right? Everyone who's hitting play on this podcast are thinking about meaning and, and purpose. And those are, those are human human questions. Um, so you're you're res you're wrestling in the same. Uh, I don't know what's the analogy here. We're wrestling in the same arena. <laughs> we're, we're all stumbling and fumbling in the dark, is the way I like to put it. And uh, I like that. Every, every once in a while, somebody uh, finds some sort of uh, somebody becomes incandescent for a moment, and we're like, oh, what's there you go. I love that. I love it. That's a great analogy. Well, let's kind of rewind the clock here. So you said you went to school for, you know, school for journalism. Can you narrate for us just maybe some of the major twists and turns along along the way? Sure. I uh, I went to school later in life. I went to school in my uh, like at twenty seven. So I uh, I I left high school and went to college for a minute, and then I, I of all things uh, decided to I got into a horrible car wreck that uh, uh, shattered my spine in a couple places, and I was uh, in bed and did all sorts of therapy to, to be able to walk again. And then I, um, got a very tiny settlement from that and not knowing what to do with that money because I, I grew up, uh, a very, uh, I, I would not, wouldn't use the word. What's the word that isn't the bad word in this case. I, I, I grew up, uh, Under resourced. <laughs> we had to save. we had to save up to buy a VCR. It was that kind of yeah. family. And yeah. so with that money, I, uh, I had grown up uh, on those in the summers working on my grandparents' farm and then I loved animals. And I, so I, uh, started a pet, bought a pet store, started a pet store and, wow. uh, and it did so well. I got started a second one in another city. And, but then I quickly learned I didn't like doing that. And <laughs> because if you love animals, that's not a good, uh, career mm. to get into as far as I'm mm. concerned. I'm not, I hate to disparage anyone who's doing a great job at, a, at being a pet store owner, but for, it just wasn't yes. for me. So I, left that and started, I did work construction for a while, 
uh, dug ditches, pulled cable. Uh, I was the strong man on the job that picked up the heavy things. And then I sold leather coats. Uh, I, I installed electrical control systems, all sorts of that kind of work. And, yeah. but eventually uh, I got married and then I, we agreed that we should get educated and we went back to school and I thought I was going to be a psychologist. I guess what I really, cause I was always had this obsession and fascination and I was all the way to the, to the last classes to get the bachelor's degree on my way to being a, a therapist. When there was a little piece of paper I saw posted up on campus that said opinionated question mark in big bold letters, big Helvetica, big letters. And I said, uh, yeah. yeah, and I was like, I am opinionated. And, I, and underneath it, it said, uh, come write for the uh, school newspaper. So mm -hmm. uh, I walked in the office, office and said, how do you do this? He was like, yeah, just email me something. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I... So I emailed him a opinion piece. I had, I had found this in one of my psychology classes. We had found there was this research about how when a, when a person's favorite sports team loses, uh, the, their sperm count goes down. I don't know if that, uh, research, <laughs> I don't know if that research has been replicated and has held up to scrutiny, but I remember at the time thinking that was funny in some weird way. Because <laughs> this, the the team at our university has lost every single game that year so far, <laughs> and I thought it would make for a fun title, a, a fun headline yeah. that said yeah. um, "Sperm Counts at Record Lows on Campus According to the Latest Research." <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and then, the, and then you know the the joke is that you read it and it's like, the, well, uh, the research suggests that in this situation that would be the case, and then it was a sure. fun. And I had so I had already found a little bit of my voice there, like uh, uh, writing about yeah. scientific topics in an approachable way, with with, uh, mm -hmm. with you know being a little uh, cheeky about the whole thing. And it just there was an immense amount of response to that one little piece. And one of my professors mentioned it in class without telling, without knowing that I was the one who wrote it. And he's like, "Have you seen this? It was my it was the Latin, of all things it was the Latin professor." And he was like, "Have you <laughs> seen Have you seen this? This is great." <laughs> and, uh, that was it. I like, it didn't take yeah. much for me to, to switch. I was like, I think I'm going to go into that degree. So I switched to journalism and uh, I quickly moved through that world. I had a lot of passion. So I, I, I uh, became the, the opinions editor and then the news editor. And then eventually I was the executive editor of the newspaper. And that led to be when I graduated, I went straight into newspapers and mm -hmm. in the newspaper world, I did cops and courts reporting, higher education. And that was a, re that really gave me a strong work ethic and, and, and less, uh, one of the things that gave me the most it gave me was not being really uh, not being so married to your words, not being so invested in, in something that you can't finish the thing. Uh, it really oh. like kills your procrastination instinct because uh, yeah. you, had to, you had to put out a 500 word piece every, every day and you had to have a, a 1500 piece every Sunday or everybody had a different what day of the week on our, our team. And, and you're just, you're just constantly producing material and constantly getting ready to produce new material. Did that for I did that for a while, and then eventually I, I went into television journalism, where I did the back end stuff, web web stuff, and was on in front of the camera if you, uh, off and on. Did voiceover work, all that kind of stuff, and that led to of all wow. things, a uh, I wanted I just didn't get to write anymore, and so I wanted to start a pot uh, a uh, not a podcast. Those weren't even invented yet. I wanted to start a uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure uh, I wanted to start a uh, a blog because blogs were very popular at this period of time. They were. What I liked was there were these blogs that were coming out that had there were only about one thing, one very thin slice. Uh, yeah. One was like uh, shit my dad says and uh, yeah. awkward family photos and mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. And I thought it would be great to make one about there was the Darren Brown person swap experiment, which I love. It's well, it's actually it's a person swap experiment done in in psychology, but Darren Brown turned it into a show where it, someone walks in front, of, someone asks you for directions, and he did it on like a college campus. And then as they're talk, as you're giving them directions, two people walk between you holding a big, uh, in this case, it was a portrait of Darren Brown, but in the real study, it was like a door. But one of the people holding it switches places with the person who was asking for directions. And then they measure <laughs> how often people notice. But they even yeah. ask them afterward, did you notice? And I was stunned to, to learn that in some runs of the experiment, like, you know, more than half the people don't notice. And overall, about 45% of people don't notice, right? And I, and I thought that that was probably true about so much in life that we have this uh, yes. undeserved confidence that we see the world exactly as it is, that our thoughts, feelings, and uh, are the best thoughts and feelings we could have. 
all of our beliefs are true and so on. And mm -hmm. I thought it would be a cool idea for a blog where I would just take that kind of material and throw it on there. But every once in a while yeah. I wrote pieces for it, the pieces started to gain momentum. And before I knew it, I had gone viral and had an audience and I wrote a piece about brand loyalty that went super mega viral and that got the attention of the publishing world. And mm -hmm. I was swept into that. The great, uh, Aaron Malone Borba, uh, who is still my agent, she extended her hand and said, you should come into this world. And so I did, and I wrote, you're not so smart. And that became an international bestseller very quickly. And then I wrote, you are now less dumb. And to promote you, you're now less dumb. I started a podcast because that was a new thing that wasn't really a thing that people cared about. There were like two podcasts that people listened to radio lab <laughs> and this American life. Yes. But I, but I love both of them. I love them. And I was like, I could do stuff like that. And I wanted yes. to, do so I promoted the book with that. And I just happened to be there at the right place, at the right time when that exploded. Yeah. And, but I stuck to it. I was like, I want to make good stuff. And mm. I brought in, although I don't recommend anybody listen to my first 20 episodes, if you like what I make today, because <laughs> on, on my first episodes, it, it, it's like the, hello there, welcome to the Your Nostal Smart Podcast. I'm like, I'm like talking like, a, I'm going to give you like a drive time traffic report. Yeah. And that exploded too. And now that's, that's become sort of the center. Of it. I think of it more like, it's like the sun in my, in my uh, stellar system. It's my, yeah. it's, the, it's the thing that everything else sort of revolves, uh, revolves around. around because I can, I can constantly be making shows about things I'm interested in, in this sort of uh, beat that I've created. And mm -hmm. those, when those things have promise, they can spin off to become other things or bigger projects, or I can take my yeah. bigger projects and pull them into the podcast. It's a great place to do that. And that's become a centerpiece. So all this together has led to, at some point, I was, I got deeply fascinated with how people do and do not change their minds. And how do you reach yeah. out to people? Is there, a, is there a science to persuasion? Is there a science to all this weird stuff that's going on in our partisan, strange, polarized world? I made a bunch of shows about it. And... I just, it, it was very clear that that should be a book. And that became a, a, a little bit more than five year project that just finally concluded in a book called how minds change, which came out of all things yesterday. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even realize that it was just released yesterday, which is so exciting to be just talking to you so, so close to the release date. Love, love the book. Um, and want to definitely want to, want to dig into it a little bit. Um, cause I, I, I feel like it's like I don't know. It, it feels mind blowing to me, and this is really my first exposure to your to your work is through through oh, this wow. book. And so I've cool. I've got a lot of catch up. I've got a lot of catch up work to do. So I hope you'll you'll forgive me forgive me for uh, for not you know, <laughs> no. not being a super fan as of you know uh, until this moment, right? But I want to I think maybe just kind of just break break that down just a little bit. Just kind of the the construction of your of your universe or, or solar system as, using that analogy. Like at what point did did you leave leave newspaper and and really focus on the blog and podcast and, and, and books, or, you know, was it kind of like a gradual fade or was it like this decisive moment where like, I'm just taking this leap. What was that transition like for yeah, you? Yeah. Um, I was, I wasn't doing, I remember very clearly how this took place. Uh, I hadn't thought about this in years. I was, you know, I would, I would work on the blog all the time while also doing my, you know, eight hour a day plus commute job. And at that job, I had moved up into a management position where I was the head of a department and I had a lot of responsibilities and had to go to those meetings where everybody sits around and looks at each other and wonders why we're doing this every week. And <laughs> like it, it wasn't the kind of, it wasn't the kind of, it's a news operation. So it was a TV, full TV station operation. So the news is one part of it, but you would also have the people who are the heads of engineering, the head of like uh, sales, like everybody would be there, but it was just, yeah. it was the news operation also had its meetings. So it was just strange. It was a lot of you're like, why yeah. you, you a lot had, of meetings. <laughs> it felt like, uh, it felt something like something on the enterprise, like on star Trek, like, like we're, yes. the, we're all the heads of different departments, but y'all have no idea what we're doing in our department. So let's just yeah. kind of hang out and drink coffee and joke about <laughs> stuff. And then we realized, Oh wait, we didn't do anything. And then we'll follow up emails. That'll handle it. That was yeah. what it was like. So I was doing that and I was loving that I had his whole second life where I was working on uh, my blog and then the blog became a podcast and I was still working there during that period of time for a little while, but I started getting speaking engagements and mm -hmm. speaking engagements are the best for, for me personally. I love going out and doing, making, doing lectures and meeting people. 
and I was burning through all of my holiday time and then all of my sick time. I, I make no apologies for per saying I'm sick when I'm not. I don't. Uh, I don't we don't yeah. do enough. We don't <laughs> do enough leave in the United States, so uh, I, I'm totally okay with it. And they started not liking that, and uh, corporate uh, started to take more of an interest in my news. I was at a, a place that had been independent, and then they were bought by a giant media conglomerate. And then so the corporate people started coming in pretty regularly, and wanting to make changes. And they, what the what the the exciting moment of all of this was that there was a shakeup in, in management. We had a new news director, and he asked for a meeting with me. And he, and at the, it was just, just me and this one guy on two ends of a conference table, like, like that, like when Vicky Vale met <laughs> Batman, not yeah. when Vicky Vale, uh, Vicky Vale had dinner with, uh, Bruce Wayne. And, okay, um, yeah. and he said, David, I just want to, I just want to know, do you work for, do you work for us or do you work for yourself? Mm. And, and I, Oof. I didn't hesitate. I was like, I work for myself. I work, yeah. working here is working for myself. But also making myself is working for myself. Are you asking me to if for, about my loyalty to the company? And it was like, yeah. I was like, I don't have any loyalty to this company. Like, like I don't like. What kind of mm. you're you're demonstrating your disloyalty to me in this moment? And I got it was one of those things. And wow. I said, I've been I've been able to do this job and the other thing for all this time. If you're asking me to make a choice between the two, I'm going to choose the other thing. And he says, I'm asking you to make that choice. And I put it in my notice. And wow. And that's when I was like, oh, I better really do a good job at my thing from going forward. Game on. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's seriously how I left uh, that world. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. What a, um, yeah, poignant, poignant moment. It just kind of made me sweat, like imagining, <laughs> imagining just being asked that so point blank. Um, and, and I had no indication that was coming. Like there was no, yeah. there was not like I was building up to it. I wasn't taking a shower that morning and putting on my, my clothes thinking, what am I going to say in that meeting? Uh, the meeting came out yeah. of nowhere. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Looking back, I mean, did it feel like it was time? Did it feel like it was a stretch? Like how did it, how did it go after, after you left that meeting? I think, I mean, you know, this is I actually write about this, not this, this moment in the book, but I do write about the post-traumatic growth in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes people, no matter what's happened to them, they say it was the best thing that, ha that could have ever happened to them. Yeah. But whether or not that's always entirely true, you could never know because we can't run this whole thing a couple of times and see what different yep. realities would have done. But uh, I can say in my case, it it incentivized me to do something I should have done a little earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And that's often how it goes, right? Like we need we need a little bump to to get out of the nest mm -hmm. usually. And most yeah. most of the time when we, we are at those transition points, tra transitions are hard and scary. And it's it's really takes a lot of, of guts and ego to be able to say like, yeah, I'm leaving, I'm leaving this safe thing to go out on my own without some extra prodding from the outside. So, oh, yeah. I mean, cause it was, it, true. it was immediately no healthcare, immediately, yeah. uh, no dental, no, no vision. It was immediately yeah. not a steady paycheck. It was immediately all these things. And I would never recommend anyone do make that shift until you have built up your other thing to a certain place where you totally. can feel like you can jump into it. But it, I was like, I have all this time that I, that I was not use, using on this. Now I can apply it to this. It's like that yeah. old, uh, whenever you pay off a bill, uh, don't just start spending that money, like apply that money to the other bills. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was, that's what I was doing, doing my time and effort. And it, yeah. and it paid off because the podcast went from being a okay audience to a pretty big audience. So they're a bit big for like uh, the kind of material I was putting out and, uh, the, I was, I had the freedom to do lectures after that. And that opening up that space gave me the ability to do, to be a lecturer, to go on circuits and things. So, uh, yeah, I, mm. but it, but what it did also require is, oh, now you have to hustle like this. Yeah. If you do what you, if you do what you love for a living, you will then do what you love for a living all day long. I had, that is something that's worth noting. I had to develop, I was overworking myself to the point of ruining my life for sure mm. for a couple of years yeah. there. And I got advice from Corey uh, Doctorow and Mark uh, Fraunfelder over at Boing Boing because they were they were very helpful. Boing Boing was one of the first places to put "You Are Not So Smart" in like a front page sort of way on their website. Yeah, uh, it was featured there. They had a little podcast network for a couple of years, and cool. I was like, I, I I don't know how to stop working. And they were like, Oh, you just keep hours. Like like mm. you 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 work. I know you're working for yourself now, but you need to get up, 
take a shower, put on your clothes, like, or, or whatever you, whatever your routine is, but yep. do the routine you did for work. Then you go into your office and you work for eight hours a day or six hours, four hours, whatever is your optimum flow. And then when you're yep. done, you're done. Like don't yeah. work all day. And mm. the other great advice was keep, uh, leave a ragged edge. So if you're a writer or you make podcasts, if you're doing anything creative, don't like make yourself get to the end of the thing. If you, yes. when it's time for you to get up and leave, just stop mid paragraph, stop mid sentence yeah. and come back. Cause the greatest thing that gives you is when you come back to it, you know exactly what to do. Like you, you could just yes. start right back in. And yes. oftentimes when I've been frustrated with something, just, I walked away through the rest of my day, slept, woke up. And when I sat down, it was immediate what I was supposed to do. I, I, I do exactly mm -hmm. how to finish the thing that, that beforehand was, I felt like I might be getting to some kind of writer's block. So those two pieces of advice wow. really changed things for me. Fantastic. Fantastic advice. It feels like the newspaper world really helped you cut your teeth in like developing a, a work ethic, a, a, a and not just a work ethic, but like, um, I think like you said, you said, like being just saying, saying what you have to say and letting, I, I don't know exactly the words you put to it, but like calling the piece done and, and hitting publish, right? Like that you got, got so used to, used to that. And then it feels like, at least from the outside, you know, that you're able to take that same work ethic, that same, um, just f routine, I guess, of just publishing and then apply that outside of, you know, that you just have to add on your own schedule and you're doing that same work within that own, your, your own schedule. It seems like it, it really, you know, I think benefited you in a lot of ways that like, yeah, yeah. If you hadn't done but, that newspaper work. I don't know that you, I mean, I don't know. Would, would you, would you have been no. able to arrive here? No, because podcasting in particular requires that mindset. Like you can't be too yeah. precious with it. Yeah. The way you get away from being too precious with it is be very transparent and open with your audience. Like just mm. say out loud, like, what you're thinking and feeling and talk about get let them see the back you know how the thing was made be who you are yeah. be yeah. authentic and transparent and be vulnerable to your audience and your audience will be okay with you putting out content on a schedule that you've put yourself to and then yeah. as you keep doing that the content keeps better keeps getting better each iteration yeah I, when it when it comes to writing books i still get I'm, i try not to be precious with my words but I mean, I have spent two or three weeks on an opening paragraph, but not on, but not like in the beginning, like, cause what I learned from newspaper world, at least when it came to making the longer form pieces is you write crap, you, you don't even use proper punctuation. It's, it's a yeah. garbledy mess. And then you start, you shape it up over a little bit by a little bit. And then you, yeah. I have a method that I use where I have a, I have a line that I draw across the page or like a, a horizontal line. And, uh, I put all of my, uh, thoughts and notes and material beneath the line and the piece as it's forming is above the line and mm. the piece above the line is still like terrible but uh yeah. everything that's not every errant thought has a place to go and yeah that and that way uh and every time a little piece of something like, i should research that i'll take a note and research that and then when i research yeah. it I, I pull it down below the line and then i just keep pulling stuff up and shaping it and then eventually there's what's left underneath the line is total garbage or is it doesn't uh -huh. fit it doesn't <laughs> It doesn't Goes somewhere fit else at least. Piece. Yeah. 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 Or it doesn't seem to fit in this piece. It doesn't serve a purpose anymore. Yeah. So you yep. can take all that, save it into a separate file and then shape up what you've got. That helps you not be precious with your words. Cause yeah. you know, if you were writing long with, you know, if you were writing with a pen and paper pencil or on a typewriter, you would, uh, it's difficult to sit there. You can't just re-edit the same sentence and paragraph yes. 10,000 times, yes. but on a computer, yes. you can get into a loop where you will never finish the thing. So you need to create yes. some sort of practice for yourself. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. I know, especially when I was starting out with the podcast, uh, was so meticulous. I mean, similar to you was like, so inspired by radio lab and this American life was like trying to like put produce that, that kind of quality and you know, basically would spend, you know, 16 18 hours editing a editing an episode because it's just me right yeah. they have yeah. whole production teams they have they yeah, have they people have whose people. job is, is to score just to do the music you know and so all, all of that just really really resonates um with me and i think even even what you're saying about vulnerability i feel like that's um a place i have to grow and just sharing more like being just more open and transparent so that's a that's a good good note and good challenge to me that i'm gonna I put in my, yeah, in my I, mind i get it man like audiences you know, I don't know. There's all sorts of ways that you'll form this bizarre 
feeling that you have to be perfect in front of your audience. But um, yeah. we're on a three, a sort of a three generational spread right now of people who have watched enough YouTube videos, played around with enough social media, and now we have things like TikTok, where the audience is totally understands how stuff is made, and yeah. your desire to look perfect is feels inauthentic and mm. the uh, what people want is insight they want awe they want yes. connection they want good stuff and if you make yes. good stuff it's totally okay to be open and transparent even to the point that one of the first sort of things i noticed in the space that helped people uh, i think reach that was um showing people your edits in video where it's like you're like you're trying to clean up your your presentation and instead of retaking it you just yeah. Top it, you just, and then just yeah. let people see you did that. Ta, 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 ta. Yeah. That was a, yeah. an, an example of like, oh yeah, that's cool. I know what's going on here. They're just trying to make something totally. for me because they're going to, they want to make something for me tomorrow. So today, yeah, get it, get it done. Get mm. it done. That's great. That's a great, um, the way you narrate the viewer, I think it's a really, really helpful, a helpful voice, right? Like to, it just feels like, like a generous, a generous voice. And it's, I feel like that's the, that's the more of the voice that I need in my head rather than like a critical, like, oh, I see what you did there trying to, trying to trick me. Or like, I see you, 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 you know, I see you did this in multiple takes, didn't you? You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just appreciate that a lot. That's really great. I, I felt, I, I noticed this in podcasting when I started being more who I really was and started having conversations, st stopped editing out the parts of the conversations where we just got off topic or yeah. uh, leaving in with the weirdness of this whole thing, instead of trying uh -huh. to make some sort of glossy, perfect thing that was the kind of podcast that we were listening to when we got excited about this yeah. were actually radio shows. And that's why they were like yes. that. And yes. I don't think any of us wants to be making radio from the 1990s. We want to be making <laughs> something completely of our time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. I mean, I feel like th this moment, this moment right here in this conversation is one of those moments, you know, in, in this show, right? Like where it'd be like, oh, could, I could, I could edit this out because this would just be uh, just for me. But also I think it's, you know, I think no, it's helpful. Don't edit it. Please yeah, don't. Yeah. The... <laughs> no, we won't. We won't. We won't. We'll keep it in. I promise. <laughs> that's, that's what we offer that you can't, that's what you get. If, if it was, if, if you want the other thing, you know, go watch a, a Netflix doc, but yeah, this is, yeah. this is this thing. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, I want to I want to move towards the book, but one more question just about your process before we before we get there, which is how do you decide what to what the projects are? And so I know that you mentioned that you had I'm looking at, at my my notes. I know I I put a, a I put something in in my notes here. Just about like measuring what has promise is what I is what I Oh, uh, yeah, wrote. that's great. Like, I like Yeah, that, and I'm curious. I like that wording. I'm curious, I, yeah, I'm curious about that. Like how do you how do you think about you know, the, the ideas that are, that are sticking, like in, in which ones to invest more in. And, and I just want to hear you talk about, about that piece of your process. It, it's either, I think it, for me, it's either something that I, that I really want to understand and in the, in the, or I want to know more about it. And after a first, when I do a little bit of research and I'm not talking like just Wikipedia research, I mean, going into the, the academic literature or asking an expert but also doing some of the Wikipedia, YouTube, what's, what have other people said about that? Does anybody know what I'm looking into here? I like, I, like just the other day I was, uh, I, I heard some, I, I was watching, um, our flag means death and they had somebody mm. swab, swab the decks and I was like, yeah. did they really swab the decks? And I paused yes. <laughs> and it started looking into swabbing the decks. And then like 45 minutes later, I had learned more than I'd ever thought I'd ever know about that thing. And it turned out that it was, uh, it was because of the my the, the miasmic theory of, of disease, which I uh, where people thought that there if something stinks, that's how you get sick. But they oh, but it was because they didn't it was correlation, not causation. They didn't realize uh -huh. that the bacteria and molds and bad things that you know infections smell bad. But that's it's not the thing that's making you the smells not what's making you sick. Yeah, yeah. So there was this whole like hundreds of a hundred years stretch where people were like perfume that's how you not get that's how you don't get sick or oh, uh, interesting and and uh sanitation for the sake of it smelling better became a big mm. deal and then they would swab the decks of ships relentlessly all the time uh just for the sake of it, it needs to we need to get rid of any of the any bad smell that may have arrived on this deck it turns out it did nothing at all 
and it even caused the ships to break down faster over time and it took up precious uh, uh hours that could be put yeah. on doing other stuff on a ship so that's 45 wow. minutes of, of my life that i love that, that so yeah but i didn't I, I and then i took a note i was like there's something in here maybe that i might use yeah. for something later so if if I, if anything excites me in that way it's not it's not the that i'm curious about it it's that when i looked into it 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 gave me that feeling of oh what do you know yeah. and oh wait that yeah. actually kind of synthesizes some other ideas floating around that goes yeah. into the bucket of hmm that could be material that has promise as you said yeah. um and the other thing is some stuff won't leave just will not leave me alone like it's it it, it feels like it insists upon itself like it's it's yeah. it's an it's an idea that you that that it, it didn't come and go that one day or that one afternoon yeah. it keeps coming back to you and it, it, those are the things that have always resulted in the best stuff i've ever made um <laughs> my agent today says if i have a because i'm always pitching concepts and uh, for it's like well, what, 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 maybe the next book can be about this and she just doesn't uh, suffer anything that doesn't get mentioned 10 times like if it's, <laughs> if it's mentioned one, as I mentioned, in one meeting, one conversation, one email, like it goes in the dump pile. But, but the if I, if something I can't stop talking about or I can't stop yeah. the mentioning is like you're you should that that feel that's the thing you're going to be doing because if you want to if you're yeah. going to commit to two three four years on something, it has to be the kind of thing that you can't let go that you yep. you must see through. And I did a of all things something has, has that has stuck with me for years is. I just don't, the, I, the, the fact that we throw around the word genius was is something that blew my mind and I couldn't get rid of it. I, I was like, what do you mean Steve Jobs is a genius and Elon Musk is a genius? You mean like Beethoven genius? And, uh -huh. and then you mean like Michelangelo genius? Or what do you mean? What do you mean genius? Do you mean genius like Einstein? Genius? What does genius even mean? And I couldn't get it out of my head because a lot of my work is about, uh, it's called You Are Not So Smart, it, it, but I also am fascinated with people who seem very smart and then yeah. i was like well what does that even mean what does smart mean and i started having this like uh -huh. what does that mean thing yeah but at the same time a lot of my research for the latest book was about articulating the ineffable the idea that you um when by just giving something some sort of definition we can all agree upon it it, it, it shrinks big ideas into little blocks and those little blocks mm. can then be made can become the building blocks of bigger ideas and once the mm. idea gets big you can shrink that down and eventually you have these very complex concepts that but it's language itself is part of it so i was the idea idea spaces and language spaces and then there's a concept like genius that that you can play in that world for both which also connects to all the other stuff i'm interested in it, it was one of those rolling thunder oh i can't stop thinking about it things so the second yes. i turned in how minds change i was looking for a copy of <laughs> the second i turned that book in the manuscript i just started emailing people in the world of uh, intelligence research and then I uh, reached out to Mensa and it's like, hey, do you know people with high IQs that'll talk to me? And then within a month, I was on the road and I was I'm the first I'm the first journalist that got to go to Mensa headquarters because of this bizarre thing that I this email <laughs> this email yeah. blast that I put out, and they became this uh, uh, that you would think that I would like take a bunch of naps after finishing a book but instead i went on the road and made a seven hour audio documentary about the nature of genius and the, both the word and the concept wow. and that'll be my yeah. next book that'll be my next book i love it i love it so that's so great that's things have promise it for in two ways to like give a short yeah. answer it's if you were curious about something and in in the course of like trying to learn more about it you got that feeling that awe feeling that oh that and you 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 knew you were going to tell somebody about it you're going to tell yeah. somebody at the next party or you tell somebody, you know, over coffee, hey, the other day I was looking at this thing. Could you know that blah, 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 blah? That's got promise because you're going to do yep. that for, you could do that for a big audience. And the other thing is an idea that, that just won't leave you alone. It insists upon yeah, itself. It just haunts you. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, that makes a ton of sense. And especially in the context of like, like you said, like it takes, takes years to write a book. I think as I was reading, um, I feel like at some point in the book, you said something about writing, writing this book in 2016. I was like, wait, yeah. I, thought this, I thought this just came out, you know, I'm like, that's a long, that's a long haul. <laughs> it's a long haul. <laughs> it, it was, it was delayed because of COVID, but, um, sure. but it's not like it just sat there. Like I worked on it all yeah. over through COVID. In yeah. fact, in fact, that is, there's a lot of material about COVID in there. So yes, um, it's very timely. Yeah. It ends, so it ended up being 
mega timely because of all that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I, this is a project I've been thinking about forever and ever and ever. Yeah. 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 Well, so the book, you know, for listeners, um, how, how minds change the subtitles, the surprising science of belief, opinion, and persuasion just, I mean, I feel, I, I wouldn't know what I expected when I opened, when I opened this. Um, but you know, just my first, you know, just to give me my first reactions. One is like, I love just how story based it is. It's like takes these concepts that are very heady, but like puts them in in context of of just a great narrative. And so it's just it's just a fun. It's really a fun fun book to read. So just well well done. I guess is where, where I want to start. <laughs> That's great feedback. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't know how people would react to that, and at some point yeah. I started wondering. I started getting that sense that I think people won't like, might not like this, but I like this. And yeah. my love of prose came from literary journalism. It came from things like Frank Sinatra has a cold, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, the work of John Jeremiah Sullivan. Like these were all people who wrote hard core journalism pieces in the style of fiction. Yeah. And, and then John Ronson, came into the world with the, he sort of blended the gonzo style with that style, which mm. instead of, but it's where you, you tell the reader what you're thinking and feeling, but you don't make, but only, but you still do it in an object, you make subjectivity objective by just reporting on your own thoughts without saying, that, yeah. without, without expressing opinions. Yeah. And I just, all it always bothered me, or it has bothered me for years that I, had never gotten a chance to produce something like that for a big audience. And, and I, mm. this felt like the, the place to do it. Cool. And so, so that's one of my, I, I just assumed that was just your style. And um, since I have less exposure to your other, your other material, this is, this is kind of a new, you know, a, a new format or new um, style for you. It's the way I've written stuff for myself. And it's the way I've written yeah. things uh, when I was a print journalist, but when I yeah. became uh, the person who makes you are not so smart stuff, it was all written yeah. more in that blog, in a blog style in a, yeah. in a Ted talk essay style. So totally, I, totally. I got, this is a chance to go to the thing that sort of love the thing for me. I love it. I love it. Well, it's, it's super, super fun. One of the things that as I was, as you know, just reading, I feel like my kind of my takeaway is like, I feel like this book is dangerous and I'm curious what you're, thoughts are about about that idea how do you feel like what do you feel like people yeah i mean i don't know because like the stuff in here on one hand i'm like this could be used i don't know maybe maybe to to for ill intent it'd be one thing and then the other direction i go with it is like i feel like i don't even know what i i don't even know what i believe anymore after, after reading this <laughs> Well, uh, your, sec your, your second point makes me feel good. The first point is, yeah. is a is a criticism I've received several times, or not not a criticism, oh, a, a fear. Uh, it's a point we yeah. bring up. Um, yeah. I also ask that same question of every of anyone in the book who I would consider an expert on persuasion. Yeah. Uh, I even as a, a bonus for people who pre-ordered, I did a, a roundtable interview with some of the persuasion experts in the book, and that was one of the questions I put out in the interview. Yeah. And that roundtable thing. Um, one mm -hmm. of the answers I've gotten back is there's persuasion. There's all sorts of routes to persuasion, uh, propaganda, fear. There are, we know throughout all of history that those things can be very successful. The persuasion techniques that I'm advocating in the book are the, are the ones that they challenge either yourself or the person you're, you're, you're speaking with to understand their reasoning and how they arrived at certain justifications and explanations for what they think, feel, and believe. And is it, have they done their diligence in, the, in this? So. It's yeah. a, it's, it's an attempt to ask people, what do you truly believe? It's putting your own thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, uh, on, on trial in a way, you know, it's, 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 it's asking you, are you using a methodology an epistemology that helps you arrive at the truth or, or a more mm. accurate view of the world? Is it help? Do, are you taking a look at your attitudes and seeing if they cause harm or reduce harm in the world? Yeah. Are your values something that could be, um, sorted differently to get what you want out of life, to make the, to make, mm -hmm. to make the world the way you would see it. So in that sense, there, there, the, I see all that as, uh, not bad, but the, yes. uh, the, the, at the same time, yeah, there, there are ways of using these techniques, whether in marketing, propaganda, p politics, or, or some other, uh, thing that would might be considered heinous. I could see the idea, see people seeing it though. Like, Oh, what if somebody yeah. tried to use this yeah. on me? Yeah. The suggestion there is in one way. If you want to be, if you want to believe things that are true and you want to hold attitudes that are just, then there should be no fear mm. because mm. The, then yeah. there's, that's one of it. But I think the other thing I is, could somebody, use, could somebody use these techniques to make me feel, believe something that isn't true? Could they use these techniques to make me 
uh, hold an attitude that is harmful. I don't think so. That's not how, that's not yeah. the that's not the techniques I'm talking about in the book. Yeah. And also, I'm I'm very straight up in the in the in the introduction. Like nothing here is about coercion and manipulation. Like yes. it's transparent. It's open. Uh, mm -hmm. The other person agrees to do it. And their agency is never under threat. You actually say out loud, "I would like to explore this with you and and possibly change your mind about it." And if they agree to that, you know, there's, there's no coercion involved. So yeah. that's where I'm at with it. Uh, Love it. I feel pretty good about it. Although I'm sure that there are bad people in the world that could grab this book day one. They're like, ah, this is going to be great yeah. for my uh, red pill account. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a great, a great response. And I, yeah, I, I feel like the process that I guess you discover and you kind of uncover that leads, yeah, of this, having a conversation about beliefs. If, would I maybe just articulate some of it of my understanding of it to, to listeners and maybe then you can correct me is like helping people connect the dots between what they believe and the experiences in their lives that that have led them to to hold those beliefs and then question whether or not those are beliefs like that that's the belief that they want to hold in in the current reality knowing that you know those things often are in the past those things often experiences and and things have happened a long time ago and a lot has happened since and that they might be different people now than they were when they had those experiences or initially you know um chose to have those beliefs mm -hmm. how how did i do you did good you're describing one of several techniques uh yeah. that's deep canvassing yeah. in the book one of the weirdest things one of the most amazing things this is a great example of of all of our we we're talking about in our previous conversation i had this idea for a book and i did and the book that i wrote had is almost only four percent of the ideas in there like it's it, it is it, its own thing that i that i had no, did not expect to write and i decided to yeah. also just just Wild. put that in the book like in the book i just yeah. tell you like here we go and then by the end of it you're like oh wow you went places you didn't think you were going and, <laughs> And one of those things was when I went out and talked to persuasion experts, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. they're activist groups, sometimes they're scientists, sometimes they're therapists, sometimes they're people who are not activists, but they're in a, they have this thing that they've discovered and they do on, uh, out there in the public and the AB test. I was astonished to find that of all, all these groups, they didn't know each other. They hadn't met each other. They weren't aware of each other. And they, most of them weren't aware of the underlying science. Yeah. Yet they all arrive at the same techniques. Yes. And the, same, and the technique is not just the same technique. If it's in, an, if they have it in a step by step order, it's the same order, which yeah. indicates that it's something that uh, merges or plays well with just how the, how brains make sense of the world. And so that's why yes. a lot of the book is about that. That's why I don't even yes. go into the persuasion techniques till about two page two hundred, because I yeah, need, yeah. I want you to to know what's under, the underneath all this. One of them is deep canvassing. One is street epistemology. One's smart politics. There's also things like motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy and all sorts of stuff. Uh, elaboration mm -hmm. likelihood model. All these things are in the book. Deep canvassing was developed by the uh, LGBT Center of Los Angeles, going door to door, trying to see why people voted against Prop Eight and uh, or was was it against or for? They voted to make same sex marriage not legal, and mm -hmm. they went door to door trying to see why people did that, and they stumbled into a conversation technique that tended to cause get people to change their views on that matter by now they've had like seventeen thousand conversations all recorded on video a b tested to see what works what doesn't and then it's wild it's, it's, it's to the point now where scientists are studying what they've figured out because you could never do that kind of gigantic research yes uh, otherwise and their technique is similar to i'll talk about that and i'll talk about uh street epistemology and how they're the yeah. compare and contrast in their technique, you knock on the door, it open, you open up, you, you tell the person what you're there for. You're very open, you're honest, and they would agree that they're biased. They have a viewpoint. They would like the other person to come closer toward. In this case, they want people to be, they want to be more supportive of LGBT issues in general and law and, and vote for laws that, that go in that way. And then they, whatever the thing is they're talking about, look, that's, <clears throat> that's just one thing. That's, this has been expanded to everything at this point. They talk about climate change. They talk about immigration. They talk about gun control. Any wedge issue can fall, you'd be put here. So they say, this is what we're going to talk about. And they say, I want to, uh, I'm wondering like if you were to put yourself on a scale from like one to 10 or zero to 10 or one to 100, where you put yourself on it. This is a way to get a person to sort of express their attitude in a number. And then they will actually show them the other side's argument and then ask them what their number is again. And if it moves, they'll say, why did it move? And if they, uh, you know, they, and when you 
when you first ask the question of what your number is, you'll ask like, why is that the right number for you? And what this is, is asking a person to enter into active processing. And once you're in active processing, you can do, they do this sort of guided metacognition where, uh, and I task anyone listening, uh, like you can do this on yourself and you'll notice it's a, it's a thing that it's a, it's a different way of thinking about things. If I was say, um, something like, a the finale of Game of Thrones on a scale from uh, zero to 10, uh, 10 being it was the best thing you've ever seen, uh, the highest form of art ever created by humans. And then like zero is, uh, I would wish I had to cut off one of my feet instead of watching that. Uh, like, like yes. where would you, where would you put yourself? And, uh -huh. and when you answer that question, like, uh, let's say you say, well, I mean, it wasn't the worst thing that's ever happened, but it sure wasn't as good as the rest of it. I don't know, five, and I'm like, yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. five. Now, why, why, why a five and not a, a four? Why, why a five and not a, well, like, well, you know, there were things I liked and they start, they start uh, elaborating. They start, they start yeah. unfolding the idea and it's no longer this like, yes, no, black, white. It, it, it starts, you start understanding that you have these complexities and multitudes of inputs that are what are fueling you having a end result conclusion or end result attitude. Yeah. And in this particular technique, when you show them a attack ad or something that causes that to move, you'll say, well, what you, I wonder why it moved. And then now you're starting to see, well, oh, these things have influences on certain aspects of my uh, psyche that I didn't know if I ever had noticed until this. And you start giving a person power over their own conclusions instead of just arriving mm. at it, like, yes. like, like bumping your knee against the table and getting some pain. Uh -huh. in it. Like there's a, you start having a, you're offering up the person an opportunity to actually form a true opinion instead of just yes. having a reactionary opinion based off of all of the inputs they received through uh, received wisdom or uh, maybe some some unique experience they had that they didn't get that didn't get folded into it properly all this stuff and mm -hmm. there's no there's no magic to it after that like yeah. you're simply holding space for a person to think about something in a in a way that's safe and non-judgmental yeah and then clearly you're a trusted a nice person who wasn't there to do anything weird and you seem to have a different way of looking at it they become curious and open to it and they have an incredible success rate with this just opening yes. up that kind of conversation tends to get people was when a person elaborates how they feel about something for the first time they pretty much always move like the attitude yeah. goes a little bit more one way than the other often more in the direction that you would that that matches the attitudes that they're looking for that's steve yeah. k i was saying uh Street epistemology is more about fact-based things. And mm -hmm. it's more about hardcore, is the earth round or flat kind of things. Yes. Um, are vaccines, are they full of microchips and, and were they created yes. by the deep state? Or is this something that will help us not get COVID? Like yeah. facts. Now, of course, these beliefs that people hold are attitudes influence whether or not you consider something true or false, or they also influence how you cherry pick evidence and say, this is, uh, this is a fact and this is not. Yeah. But that's not part of the conversation up front. What what you do is at first, same thing, you build rapport, you're open, you're honest, you ask if you'd like to work together to maybe talk about it, something that you believe and where those beliefs come from. When you get all this agreement, then do the same. It's a scale thing. I was, they, they use a scale too. They say, okay, yeah. on a scale, like if you, the earth is flat as on, uh, you're, you're, let's talk about your certainty mm -hmm. and people will then say where they are on the scale and then the question will be, you know, why this number? Like, if you said, do you think there is round or flat? <laughs> and the person say, like, I'm not sure. I'd say it's like somewhere if flat is a one and round is a 10. I don't know. I'm like, or you might just say, how certain are you that there is flat on a scale one to 10? I think that's the best. That's how, that's the better way to, 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 yeah. to explain it. Cause they ask for a claim and then they ask for your confidence in the claim. So the earth is flat. Okay. Scale one to 10. How, how certain are you that that's true? I'm sort of a seven on that. Well, oh, a seven's not a 10. So I'm wondering how come you aren't all the way up to a 10. And then the person starts telling you reasons why they aren't all already a 10, which means they already have counter arguments inside them that they haven't yep. rejected. Mm. And then you ask for what, what reasons do you have to hold that level of confidence? And they'll give you the reasons. And then you ask, what method did you use to arrive at, at the conclusion that those are good reasons to hold that level of confidence? And of course you don't ask it the way I just, this is me telling you from a bird's eye view. Yeah. You ask it in a more natural yeah. conversational way. And what people will do is they'll investigate usually to the point where they, they'll get this 
sort of a, a, this free fall, uncanny sensation. And I think we've all experienced it before. Uh, it's something Jonathan Haidt writes about called, and his research is called moral dumbfounding, where uh, he'll have things like, he'll talk to a very conservative, very, very uh, right wing person. And, and he'll have a question on, on a, like a questionnaire that says, why would you uh, clean a toilet with an American flag? And the person will be very, very, very strongly be like, no, of course not. That's terrible. And then you ask yeah. like, like basically you Socratic method them into in asking why, and then they'll say, have all the, what they'll have already prepared ahead of time. Thanks to previous questionnaires where every single thing that a person might say, but they have all, they can throw, they can knock them all down. And so they'll, they'll say this, this, and this, and they say, well, you know, if you, this though, this though, this though, they're like, well, yeah, but this, 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 and a person starts drilling deeper and deeper down into their processing chain until they finally get to the point where like, they realize I don't actually know why I feel so strongly about this. And, yeah. And they can't articulate it because often it's something that's really deep, something in the level of uh, social primate uh, neurological network stuff. And the people will say, I don't know why it's just wrong. That's the kind of thing mm. they'll say. Uh huh. And sounds familiar. Yeah. I've, I've heard, I've heard that kind of thing before, <laughs> which means I, I don't know why I feel the way I feel, yes. but people, when we don't know why we feel the way we feel, that doesn't stop us from coming up with what we think are reasons for why we think the way we feel, mm. feels the way we feel mm -hmm. a person who's Again, a person who's not does who's against vaccines, uh, who is anti-vax right now for well, they will often tell you I'm anti-vax because, and they'll list all these reasons why. But mm. if you do a certain type of investigation with them, they'll that you'll they'll discover on their own that those are just justifications for something that I can't articulate. Yeah. And street epistemology gets a person to that place, but they do it in a way that's so safe and so conversational that it affords the other person the opportunity to save face and to feel that desire to, I should have a good reason for this. Like I should have a good, better way of arriving at reasons for this. And it's, there's a very high success rate for that moving people as well. Yeah. Interesting. So many, so many things, uh, directions to go from there that, that I, I, th I think are really fascinating. One, one is, um, I guess crossover that was fascinating to me about about all of this, especially with the the the, uh, the deep canvassing process, is related to the meaning movement. I started this whole project to help people answer these existential questions of why do we exist, what do I you know, do with my life, and a lot of people enter these conversations feeling like find me, find my work, find you know my materials because they feel really stuck in some way, and the process that they use to get back to you know those experiences and connecting some of those dots is like a direct parallel to, to what I do with people who feel like they, they don't know what to do with their lives. And it's usually about choices that they made, beliefs that they held, voices, you know, institutions, cultures, whatever it might be that have, that they have these beliefs about who they are or what they should and should not do. So it's a little bit different because it's really about identity and how they're, how they're viewing themselves, but sure. it's still really about that same core belief. So I, I just thought it was found it to just be so fascinating, just that, that parallel, um, parallel there. And it's all, honestly also really validating, like, okay, this, this <laughs> method that I've been using <laughs> isn't just something that I, you know, stumbled, stumbled on, or at least not totally in isolation. Other people are finding similar, similar processes for, you know, questioning, questioning beliefs. And, and well, yeah, uh, it's the, yeah. it's, it's the difference between entering a debate frame, entering a conversation frame, like in a debate yeah. frame, we want to uh, be right or wrong. We want to win or lose. Yeah. Uh, but there, are, there's almost, I can't think of many topics where there is a win or lose way of looking at it. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. there's round or flat. That's that, that one we can get, that one I can go with. But sure. if you enter into a debate frame to have a conversation about that with someone who strongly believes that the earth is flat, you will not get them to budge. You will not offer yes. anything to them of value because yeah. they're in the debate frame. And the only yeah. way you win a debate is not changing your mind. Yeah. If you instead go into something like a conversation space, like, you know, when you, you ever watch a movie with one of your friends and you love it, you just, you're just loving this movie. And then you leave and then they say, oh, I hate that movie. I hate that was the worst yes, movie totally. I've ever seen. And then you, yeah. and you're like, what? Like, I loved it. And then you feel defensive, and, but then you hear them out because they're your friend and you trust mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. there are other things that they share your values. Yes. And, and then they express themselves in such a way that you do move a little bit toward them, but you express yourself yeah. in such a way they move a little bit towards you because the truth was somewhere between already. Mm. And 
when it comes, I use the dress in the book to illustrate this, that the, that yeah. you see, you could, you can't help it the way you, you see the dress as black and blue or white and gold. There's nothing you can do about that. That's happening to you because of this very complicated neurological thing that's taking place. Thanks to how much sunlight you've been looking at the whole, your whole life. Yeah. But if you got into a debate with somebody about that, we're like, I need you to see things my way. They literally can't do that. But if you were to instead enter into this conversation space where I wonder why we disagree. I wonder what's the nature of our disagreement. That is the only path you could ever go down that where you would get anything close to the truth of what's going on with the dress. That's the yeah. only path you'll ever go be able to go down to get the truth of what's going on in any political or moral or ethical dilemma. And mm. when it comes to things that are fact-based, oddly enough, that's the only path you can use to get someone to move their certainty, even though that's, mm. we're talking about something that like it, it definitely is one way or the other, <laughs> but if yeah. you go into debate frame, you're never going to get somebody to open themselves up to that possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, I think that, you know, as I was imagining when I, I think it's a question I want to come back to for, for you is like, like, what do you, what do you do with this material? But one of the things that I've, I've, as I've been thinking about, like, so how, do, how, how could I implement this more in my, how could I use this in my life to help, you know, I help in relationships. Like I, I have friends and family who, have especially political. Oh yeah, we all do, right? Sometimes post conspiratorial like beliefs that like mostly I just don't engage with them around them because it feel I get anxious about it. I mm -hmm. I'm afraid of I'm afraid of the conflict. And I, th I think that that's something that's really interesting and great about the this process is that it is very open and it's just a conversation like you're saying like you're not going in to debate you're just yeah. being curious and i think that that's a, a helpful yeah a helpful I, i'm taking a note because i like the way you said that i'm taking a note like yeah we're afraid yeah. of the conflict and that's yes. why we avoid it yeah we're, we're, why are we afraid of the conflict because we've had experiences in the past where we where we we anticipate the conflict because of our experiences mm -hmm. in the past we can mm -hmm. change that we can yeah. have a we can create new experiences that that's true give us the a different way of feeling in, in motivational interviewing, they call this pre-contemplation versus contemplation. when you have a client who is unwilling to engage in introspection, who's unwilling to engage in metacognition, unwilling to engage in the therapeutic dynamic, it's mm -hmm. called pre-contemplation in psychology. And they're one of the reasons that in a family dynamic, why a person wouldn't be willing to have a conversation like this with you is often because uh, you've built a poor relationship <laughs> you've built it you've you've created you've had enough bad experiences that you're both on edge about it so mm -hmm. you can't start with you can't just jump in with this hey i want to talk to you and get and get your number scale you're going to have to rebuild yeah. the relationship a bit you're going to have to yeah. build, rebuild rapport with the person yeah and you're going to have to show them that you are and i mean I, I use this word in a bizarre way but you're an ally in the sense that you're um in the way that psychologists would describe that term ally versus enemy versus there's a whole psychological framework or we, when we first see a person, we think, is this person a potential ally, enemy, or mate, which is it's, yeah. as problematic and weird as that framing is. That's, an old <laughs> thing in, that's a weird thing in psychology, but yeah. your family members are thinking, I'm your family. And yeah. uh, these genes that are inside me built emotions and triggers that won't allow me to completely never talk to you again. But mm -hmm. if it wasn't for those, I'd probably never talk to you again because mm -hmm. I have identified you have entered into a different social uh, identity tribal thing and you're yeah. now a them and I'm an us and that's yeah. no good. You have to bypass that before you can start these kind of conversations. You're going to have yes. to get into a place where you can share. There are some values here that we align on and there are problems yes. in the world. We both agree are problems. And the thing that we're only, the only thing we're disagreeing on really is how do we approach those things? How do we solve those mm -hmm. things? How do we interpret those things? And I'm, I consider you somebody I love and uh, I want you in my life and I would rather you be valuable to me than, than not. How can we, I want to know more about how you see things because maybe there's something in there. And in mm. return, I'd like to share how I see it as well. And now you're going, instead of your face to face, you're going shoulder to shoulder into the topic. Yeah. And yeah. that is, that's where you can rebuild the relationship and incrementally move each other a little bit. Cause you might be surprised to learn maybe the reason they feel the way they feel it's, it's, it's led them to cherry pick evidence and find some weird stuff that just ain't true. But the thing that led them to it, there might be some value in their attitude. There might be some reason yeah. why they feel that way. That is worth thinking about on your own. They mm -hmm. might have certain fears and anxieties that aren't completely unjust. And yes. they also, and that's something that is worth investigating with someone who is close enough to you that you're going to have Thanksgiving with them. 
Yes. <laughs> that is so so well said. And I love the 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 posture. Like instead of face to face, side by side, it 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 is a really helpful reframing. And I think, yeah, I think like the 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 biggest thing for me is like it's so much easier to just shy away from those issues in order to avoid the conflict. But I think what I hear you inviting me to is um, and listeners as well, like to know that like, okay, that probably means that there was conflict. There's been conflict that hasn't gone well, right? Like, and, and there's, there's story behind that, that needs to be, you know, reimagined and, and revisited and also then yeah. rebuilt with and my out dad of, out of that. Yeah. I had this with my dad. Uh, yeah. and I bought a truck and wanted to, uh, modify it, rebuild parts of it, fix it up. He was a car dude way back in the day, uh, like he had like muscle cars. And I was like, I'm going to come over with this. We're going to work on it weekend after weekend. And that we did that. We didn't have one single argument during that entire process because we were working on this thing together. And then at the end of that, yeah. I started to use some of these things that I talked about in the book to talk about some of the conspiracies that had entered into his politics. Mm -hmm. And those conversations for the first time in my life went well. Wow. And, wow. And, but you have to put in... The, a, a certain kind of work that I know I, I fault no one for saying like, Hey, uh, the people you're talking about in my life, I ain't doing that kind of work with them. <laughs> I totally understand. I totally understand. Yeah. Some people yeah. have done things for which it is okay to walk away from them. But the, mm. uh, if there's anybody that you would want to, that you think is worth, uh, doing this with somebody who you would like to be able to pull back away from some of these really strange conspiratorial circles or, someone who you just wish could see things a little bit more from your perspective, or at least value your perspective. Yeah. Yes. Um, there are ways of doing that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. One that that's the, the other question I wanted to ask you is just, what have you, how, how has this material impacted you and where, where has it taken you? And I think that's a, that's a great, great example. And with, with your, with your father, um, I'm curious if there's other, other places, like has it changed the way you, have conversations with friends, with family, um, what yeah. are, what, where else has it, has it taken you? It's everywhere. Like relationship stuff, totally different way of approaching conflict. Uh, when, even in my interviews now, like, uh, I'm a much better interviewer thanks to having, mm -hmm. being far yeah. more open and co and be empathetic to the other, like want, wanting to enter that, that shoulder to shoulder frame yeah, earlier mm -hmm. in the conversation. And it also has helped me to the will store my friend, will, who writes books similar to mine. He gave me this beautiful thought experiment that I almost try to repeat it like a mantra before meditating. Like, uh, mm -hmm. he said, uh, uh, ask yourself if you're right about everything. And, uh, and some, there are people in this world who'll say, yes, uh, that's a different type of person. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's hope they don't, uh, go into politics, but we know yeah. they will because that's the kind of people yes. that do that. Um, <laughs> but ask yourself, do you think you're right about everything? And the word right can mean a lot of stuff, right? Right and wrong can mean factual, can mean moral, can mean ethical, can mean political, it can mean all sorts of stuff, but let it mean whatever it means. If the answer is no, then ask yourself, well, then what are you wrong about? Mm. And pretty much all of us are going to go, I don't know. Because <laughs> yeah. if I yeah. knew I was wrong about something, I would stop being wrong about it. Yeah. Uh, the very but you know, there's no got to be something. <laughs> yeah. And so if the answer is no, and, you, and the answer is you don't know what it is you're wrong about, ask yourself, why don't you know? Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself, how would you go about learning what you're wrong about? That puts you into that scientific method disconfirmation framing that we're not really innately set up to go for. Yeah. And it's, that is the bane of journalism, right? Is, is thinking you have the answers or thinking you have the angle and then going into the piece and making the piece look the way you thought it was going to look instead of being open for it, it telling you mm -hmm. what is going on without, without being open to changing completely the whole concept thanks to what you're learning. Yeah. That's something I feel like could be applied to just about anything people do. Yeah. Mm. Mm. How much has like... As a as a journalist, as someone who's created a lot of content, and this is maybe a, a different direction, but it feels related. Is like how often do you feel like, oh, I I feel differently. I believe differently about this. And you know, X number of years ago, I wrote this piece that's wrong. <laughs> All the time. All the time. Yeah. There's, there's big parts of you are not so smart. The book uh, that have either failed replication 
thanks to the fact that science marches on or yeah. so which, which either means that it's a more complicated nuance than when I wrote about it or that it's just not so any, that science has come to a different conclusion. Mm. And there are things that were written from the perspective of, of the person I was then that I would never take that same cynical like uh, angle or I would never yeah. tell you how to live your life in the way that I was living my life in that way back then. So uh, mm. I'm a big advocate for if you look back at an old piece of writing and you think, damn, I'm, I was sure was good. That's, that's, that's something that should bother you. That means you have not grown yeah. since you last produced that work of art. I love it. I mean, that's such, that's such a good perspective. Cause I think as a, as a creator, that's one of my, you know, one of my big fears. That's where I often get into writer's block is like, Oh, like, what if I'm, what if I don't actually feel, you know, what if this isn't right? Or like, am I going to regret this? Like playing, like trying to envision, you know, where, where I go. But like, if you just go with the as assumption that like, yeah, in five years, this isn't going to be good content anyway. So just like, make it. <laughs> That's right. Um, like, so... I won't even be the same. I don't, who, who knows who I'll be in five years, but I yeah. know for certain that I'll look back at this and go, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's just a great baseline to start at. <laughs> yeah. This, every, like, have you ever, how many, how many haircuts have we looked back on of it? What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. I love it. I love it. Well, this has just been such a, such a fun conversation. I know I'm going to continue to revisit, revisit the book and definitely like it, it really is, was it is like one of the most fun and surprising journeys as far as a, a book that I've that I've been on recently, and I, and I read a lot of books. So so like again, just it's just fun. So thanks for thanks for making it. Thanks for writing it. Um, it's, it's a real it's a real joy, and um, I, I hope listeners will uh, will uh, you know pick up pick up a copy, check it out um, themselves. Oh, thank you but so for, much. Yeah, yeah. This, this been this has been one of the best uh, interviews. Uh, as I told as I told you, we've done been doing a few of these. Uh, this has been. Yeah. Uh, up there in the top you know oh. two or three thank you so much for uh you do you, this a is a i like i love your approach and i love what you're putting together here it's really great yeah thank you that means a lot um just for folks that want to connect with you follow along with your work do you have anything specific you'd like to invite them to sure if you want the you are not so smart side of things is all sort of under that umbrella uh or it is uh, that is the solar system we mentioned earlier the um you are not so smart.com and uh, you'll find everything there. It's a podcast called You Are Not So Smart. I make a lot of stuff there. That's sort of where you can find me messing around and talking to experts about stuff, figuring out what's going on. The My website, davidmcraney.com, has all the other stuff on it. And this book, How Minds Change, is out there. Uh, at the time of this recording, it came out yesterday. And I have never wanted... I've, I was, I'm very proud of it, and I really want people to read it. And I'm eager to hear yeah. people's feedback and how it may affect them. So... Go get that, please, yeah. and tell me what you think of it. Find me on Twitter and tell me just at David McCraney. I love it. I love it, and um, yeah, I'm 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 pumped for people to 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 go through it, to read it, and um, see see where this takes you. It takes us all, really. So um, yeah, this has been really fun. Thank you so much for for coming on. Thank you, man. It's the best. Thank you so much, David. What a fun conversation. I just loved it so much. Listeners, thank you for listening. If you're following along on YouTube, make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the thumbs up, even hit that bell to be notified when new episodes drop. Wherever you're listening, if you're on a podcast catcher, hit that subscribe button. You can find links to David's work at themeaningmovement.com slash David. While you're there, jump on the newsletter. We're sending out weekly newsletter packed full of information about our guests, about uh, tools that we're offering, courses, trainings, all kinds of great stuff, including one of my favorite sections, which is just a list of things that I've been enjoying, things that have been bringing me life uh, on a weekly basis. You get that once a week where we try to make it fun, try to keep it value packed. All They're all just focused on helping you level up your life, your income, your career, helping you find more success, more meaning, more satisfaction in whatever it is you're pursuing. So go to themeaningmovement.com and jump onto the email list anywhere you find those boxes on the website. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do that. Leave a rating and review, review if there's the ability to wherever you're watching or listening. Thank you so much. Our music is by Tom Rorum. Our artwork is by Eliezer Ruiz. And we'll be back with you in just a couple days. Take care.